welcome back uh, now we are going to the uh, guest lecture the second part and um, with us we have professor mark oliver uh, from australia he is going to talk to us on ibd management current perspectives uh, professor mark oliver is based at royal children's hospital melbourne australia and is a senior clinician in the department of gastroenterology and he is also the clinical professor and a fellow at the murdoch children's research center and he has got his interest prominently in ibd pancreatic disorders and liver transplantation let us listen to professor mark oliver and thank you very much uh, professor oliver for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, sharing your valuable time today uh, with us thank you very much please uh, over to you now Thank you uh, very much for your very kind introduction and uh, thank you for the organisers for inviting me to speak at your meeting. Uh, I have no conflict of interest uh, to declare. So um, everyone starts to talk off by showing uh, a bit about where they come from and this is where I come from. So this is the uh, Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Uh, the Royal Children's Hospital has just had its 150th birthday. It's the uh, largest uh, uh, teaching hospital, children's hospital in Australia with 340 beds and it's a quaternary and tertiary referral centre for, uh, for many parts of paediatric care. So my presentation today, uh, I'm going to make some general comments on paediatric IBD. I'm also going to provide an illustrative current case uh, that I look after and have been looking after for the last six months that highlights the management of a child with complex inflammatory bowel disease and where possible I'm going to bring in data from the published literature and local experience as well. So many of you are aware of uh, the different uh, pigeonholes in which we put inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, IBDU, which is clearly an overlap between the Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And of course, very early onset IBD, uh, which uh, in about a quarter of the cases is due to a monogenic disease called, related to an immune deficiency. So uh, what causes inflammatory bowel disease? Well, clearly we don't know, but the current paradigm is the factors implicated in IBD, including industrialization, diet, stress, social status, we see a lot more inflammatory bowel disease in the middle class part of the, our population, over usage of antibiotics and clearly the host genetic makeup. There are over uh, 2000 different genetic abnormalities or genetic mutations or variations that are associated with IBD. And clearly patients with IBD have a microbial dysbiosis, so they have reduced diversity and richness of their bowel flora. And all these factors come together then to cause an abnormal immune response in the gut and of course resulting in inflammatory bowel disease. At least this is the kind of simplistic paradigm that we, we work with. Um, we've published in this area, Shivani Kansal, who's one of our fellows and just completed a PhD, has looked at the microbiome in paediatric Crohn's disease, a longitudinal prospective single center study, and she, which she's published in the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis and also recently a variation of gut mucosal microbiome with ASCA antibody status in our patients with Crohn's disease. So starting off with ulcerative colitis, this is a paper from 2013 which, uh, which shared our local experience and you can see that uh, over the last couple of decades in the 1990s and 2000s we had a substantial surge in UC and uh, it, it represented uh, about 2 to 2.5 per 100,000. And you can see the world kind of figures about 1 to 4 per 100,000. And as you know, UC usually represents about 20 to 25% of all IBD cases. Um, pediatric IBD is more, uh, well, pediatric ulcerative colitis is usually more of a pan colitis picture, 60 to 80%. And more often than not, they undergo colectomy 30 to 40% compared to adults. Crohn's disease, uh, we've seen similar type of figures. Uh, this was published uh, some years ago by my colleague, uh, Professor Tony Caddo-Smith, and you can see an increasing incidence. Uh, we, we measure about two per 100,000, 
and now the estimated risk of developing Crohn's disease is between 2.5 to 11 per 100,000 worldwide. And we see this pattern in, in all, all countries uh, uh, and certainly particularly in the US and the UK. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease is not new to India, of course, and many of you will be aware of this prospect of multi-centre study that's been recently published. I'm pleased to see that names of some of our former fellows, Anshu, Rishi, Rowan, and of course, uh, Ujjal Potter, who is in Lucknow and, and spent some time with us on sabbaticals over a decade ago. And your figures would suggest that Crohn's disease, about 65% of patients, ulcerative colitis, 28%, and pan colitis is the predominant form of UC in about 60% of your patients. So I'm going to start off with my clinical case. This is a 14-year-old boy who was referred to our hospital from a nearby institution for a workup for inflammatory bowel disease. A very difficult social circumstances. I'm not sure if you face the same issues in India, but we, uh, we, we certainly, this particular family was very, very tricky to deal with. Mother unaccepting of the illness. Um, this boy presented with six or seven bloody stools per day. He was anemic, had a hemoglobin of about nine, nocturnal symptoms, high inflammatory markers, looked unwell, uh, had had stool cultures to exclude infectious causes of uh, his bloody diarrhea, which were negative. Uh, he was transferred for assessment, uh, including gastroscopy, colonoscopy, and ongoing management. Um, many of you, again, would be aware of this uh, scoring system that we use is called the PUKAI score, which has six domains. Uh, clinical remission is regarded as a score of less than 10. Mild disease, uh, 10 to 34. Moderate disease, uh, 35 to 65. And severe disease, greater than 65. And our patient on presentation had a PUKAI score of 50. So moderate disease. We also use a Mayo endoscopic scoring of ulcerative colitis, which really comes down to a Mayo 1, which is mild, Mayo 2, which is moderate, Mayo 3, which is severe. And I'm sure you can look that up in terms of the different patterns that you see endoscopically. Um, in Melbourne and certainly around most centres in Australia, we'll do a gastroscopy and colonoscopy because clearly this patient may have IBDU or may have particularly a Crohn's colitis. And we find about 25 to 30% of our patients that we scope uh, with Crohn's disease have, uh, may have a predominant colitic pattern, but have microscopic changes in the upper GI endoscopy. So this boy had a scope, his histopathology was um, good, confirmed acute and chronic changes consistent with ulcerative colitis, and he had no granulomas. And again, you'll be well aware that granulomas are usually not present in ulcerative colitis in about 30 to 40% of patients with Crohn's disease. Uh, we use a classification system, which again, people would be aware of the Paris system. Um, this boy had pan colitis, so the predominant form of UC that we see. Um, uh, not, he wasn't severe, but you could tell from his clinical picture of anemia and high inflammatory burden that he was not going to be an easy boy to turn around in terms of his disease. So when our patients get worked up, we certainly check the immunization status to see if we can, if time permits, whether we can use a window of opportunity to top up with live vaccines, which would clearly be more of a concern if we're going to be using steroids or thiopurines. Um, additional things is that we measure the TPMT activity for azathioprine th therapy, particularly as uh, uh, low TPMT activity is associated with higher bone marrow toxicity of thiopurines. Um, we also measure their bone density, uh, looking to ensure that we look after their bones in the long term. This boy had low bone density, lumbar vertebral bone density of minus 1.6. Um, clearly, uh, he was also vitamin D deficient. We corrected that. He had an MRE, uh, so that's an MRI and enterocolysis to ensure that he didn't have any evidence of Crohn's disease as well, which we knew endoscopically. I also tend to use an ANCA and ASCA, which may be useful in future plans for patient therapy. Uh, ANCAs are often positive in about 60% of patients with ulcerative colitis. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily associated with disease um, severity or early relapse, but uh, it does sometimes predict so the need for urgent uh, for biological therapy in the future. An ANCA 
can also be present in 35% of patients with colonic Crohn's disease. So there are some issues in terms of interpretation of this test. And ASCA, as you know, is, an, is a positive in Crohn's disease in about 50 to 65% of patients, mostly in children who have complex, compl complicated Crohn's disease, i.e. fistulizing or penetrating Crohn's disease. So this child was ANCA positive, ASCA negative. So moving right along to the management of pediatric ulcerative so many of you would be aware of uh, this uh, part one, which is the ambulatory care evidence-based guidelines from ECHO and the European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Hepatology. You'll recognize names like Dan Turner from Israel, Frank Rumelay from Paris, and Griffiths from Canada, and some of my Scottish uh, colleagues as well, David Wilson and Richard Russell. So when this patient first arrived, he fell into the moderate group, 40 to 60, he was systemically ill, started moral prednisolone. He had a reasonable response, which I'll come to in the first couple of weeks. Uh, and then you start tapering the steroids to try and get them off steroids within eight weeks. If they have a sufficient response, you might go on to uh, using an ASA preparation. This was an insufficient response and it moved to second line. So I didn't wait for the chronically active of a few annual flares to before we added thiopurines to his, his, uh, his uh, medication. So we stepped up his medications pretty rapidly. So induction, uh, steroids are the cornerstone for induction. Uh, studies of oral steroids for treating children uh, in active ulcerative colitis remission rates are somewhere between 50 and 65%. Um, steroid dependency is much more of a problem in paediatrics than adults, and it probably reflects the differing severity of the ulcerative colitis between these two populations. And children uh, generally tend to get more steroids and tend to have more complications related to that, particularly growth, but also osteopenia, which this boy had, and acne, which he also developed, not cataracts, though, fortunately. So because he responded partially to oral steroids, I guess the question was, should we move him on to azathioprine? And that's the choice that I made. So why did I choose azathioprine? Well, I chose azathioprine ahead of ASA for lots of different reasons. Uh, some adult data and some pediatric data. Adult data suggested 60% had a clinical benefit with thiopurines following ASA failure for, for several months. And then there's also prospective pediatric data that was presented in the American Journal of Gastroenterology and Inflammatory Bowel Disease as well, that suggested that thiopurine showed steroid free remission, remission of about 50% of one year and 72% of two years. And, and clearly this database or registry would suggest um, that, um, that uh, azathioprine, particularly in this group of patients, is more likely to be helpful. Clearly, he didn't develop pancreatitis, which we also see in about 2-3% of our patients with, with this, who are on this drug, which is an idiosyncratic reaction. So unfortunately, despite having reasonable thiopurine levels of about 250 and he was taking his medications, he returned uh, some weeks later with a PUCA score of 75. This put him in the severe range of stun. And he clearly had acute severe colitis, six bloody stools, which he was under-reporting because he was worried about getting his parents upset. He, had, he, was, he, had a, he was febrile when he came into the emergency department. He had a hemoglobin of 10, he had an ESR of 35. So clearly he fulfilled the criteria for acute severe colitis, which is not a good thing. So he was treated with IV steroids, 1.5 per kilogram in divided doses, given some antibiotics to cover any gut translocation as he was unwell in February. He had a plain abdominal x-ray to exclude a toxic megacolon. He had a stool uh, taken for C. difficile, which was negative. Uh, and we also began the workup for the next line of therapy. So that included baseline disease activity each day, a PUCA score, initial laboratory evaluation, TB screening in particularly. We don't have a lot of TB in Australia, very fortunately. But clearly, this is not a good thing to have when you're considering biological therapies such as anti-TNFs. Um, and, and a lipid profile, especially if you're going to commence the calcineurin inhibitor, we tend to favor tacrolimus as opposed to cyclosporin, probably because of our transplant background, we feel very comfortable using tacrolimus uh, and are very used to using it. And certainly patients who have low lipids 
are more prone to calcineurin inhibitor side effects, particularly neurological side effects. Um, you'd consider a flexible sigmoidoscopy to ensure that C and V wasn't a player, especially if they weren't responding to steroids. And this person was put on to um, pneumatic compression, meaning TED stockings to reduce the risk of thromboembolism, nutrition was addressed and so forth. We now go on to stage two. So this is an evidence-based guideline from the same group uh, looking at acute severe colitis. So we did uh, as much of this as you can see. Um, he was placed on his steroids. Um, we didn't need to withhold his ASA because we hadn't commenced him on his ASA. Uh, we reviewed the situation at day three and had already started work up for his second line therapy. Uh, we'd spoken to our surgeons in case he needed an urgent colectomy, uh, despite the fact that we were getting a lot of pushback from the family of not going down that path. Um, and we considered a sigmoidoscopy to look for CMV. So day five, CMV endoscopy, we get our results pretty quickly. CMV negative on, on the biopsies, PCR negative. Uh, serology, his serology is suggested for some previous exposure. Uh, we also use abdominal ultrasound uh, to look at uh, a progression of disease on day one and day five. And this is unpublished data, but certainly this boy had a, a thickened hyperemic colon. No, it's a small intestinal disease, significant fat wrapping or intra-abdominal lymphadenopathy to suggest Crohn's disease. So the decision then was, do we use tacrolimus or do we use a biological therapy? And clearly tacrolimus is usually a bridge to another therapy. And we had him on pretty good thiopurine levels. So, you know, which would we choose? Well, we chose a biological, we had made a surgical referral. So uh, in this case, uh, once we made that decision, uh, we were able to access through our government uh, and the biological therapy and uh, we used infliximab. But when you're looking and thinking about infliximab versus calcineurin inhibitors, you need to think about thiopurine, previous thiopurine exposure. Uh, but in general, there's no trial data in pediatrics. There are pros and cons for using both. And as I said, you need, if whatever you're going to use has to be a bridge to something, infliximab would be a bridge to potentially colectomy calcineurin inhibitors, a bridge to either colectomy or infliximab or surgery. And the only head-to-head -head trial has been done in adults, which is the CYSIF study, that showed that in acute severe colitis, infliximab and uh, cyclosporin were equally disappointing, 60 to 54% failure, and colectomy rate was about one in five. Uh, when you do use tacrolimus, you need to be very aware of running high levels, similar to what we run in our liver transplant patients, 10 to 15, and there's a much higher risk of renal and CNS toxicity. Once you get the patient in remission after uh, about a month, you can reduce those levels to about five to eight. Uh, looking at adverse side effects in Fleximab, you can see this is published data. And we don't actually seem to have a major problem with you know, overt infections or infusion reactions. Uh, which is very fortunate for us. But there are some limitations in Fleximab. Uh, the pharmacokinetics is influenced by the body mass index. So if you've got a low body mass index or your serum albumin is low to suggest an increased burden of inflammation, um, then you could have a poorer outcome with Fleximab. Uh, concomitant use of immunosuppressive therapy such as azathioprine is very important to reduce uh, the uh, infusion reactions. And we know that excessive fecal losses of infliximab may occur in the inflamed colon. So there's emerging data now to suggest that rather than using five per kg, which is what we're approved to do, um, we should be using more like 10 milligrams per kilogram at zero to six weeks, the induction therapy. And uh, we have the advantage of being able to approach the pharmaceutical company to top up our uh, dose that we get from our government. And also the levels of day 14 may be predictive of outcome. There is some studies here, the top two studies that time point in terms of measuring infliximab levels at two weeks, levels greater than 21 uh, seem to predict better uh, clinical outcomes with clinical remission, but less than 16 colectomy. Um, so the cycle goes on and on. Uh, steroids were tapered down over 14, 10 to 14 days. We use some Bactrim prophylaxis for pneumocystis. Thiopurin's uh, doses were adjusted. Um, he was given 
10 per kg of infliximab. His poop died powerful, which was very reassuring uh, within a few days. And he seemed to be turning the corner. So we cautiously discharged him. But then he was due for his infliximab on day 14, comes back day 12 in uh, very unwell again with the falling hemoglobin increasing stool frequency uh, up to eight per day. He was given another dose of infliximab as levels were checked, uh, his levels were in fact 20. We only got that back retrospectively. So it suggests that even though we achieved a very good level um, in his bloodstream, we weren't getting him into remission. Uh, there was no evidence of toxic med colon and a CMV diff a C difficile was again negative. So nutrition was falling away. We decided to put in the parental central line for some parental nutrition. And whilst we're getting, whilst we're getting surgery mobilized, uh, the parents were still very much against surgery. I uh, used the opportunity when he was getting the central line to do another sigmoidoscopy. And unfortunately this time, uh, his mode two uh, the recto sigmoid area continued, but he had CMV positive staining on biopsy. It's only in one cell, and I recall speaking to the histopathologist, and they said, but it's next to inflamed bowel, so she had to call it CMV colitis. Now that put us in a very awkward position because now the call was being made as CMV colitis, and maybe we should be treating CMV colitis. So, what do you do at the cold face? Well, you go to the data again. So, this time, this is a paper that came out from the Porto group, CMV infection in, in severe pediatric uh, ulcerative colitis. And uh, they had 56 patients, 15 with CMV, 41 without CMV, 94% with CMV were, were treated with antivirals. And the only important thing to say is that CMV clearly predicted increased requirement for colectomy. It didn't, none of these patients just developed disseminated CMV. But nevertheless, since I was being pressured by my ID physicians to, you know, treat him, which I did, um, I spoke to my, what do you do? I, you call a friend. So I called my friend Dan Turner in Israel and asked him what he thought. And his advice was probably a marker for disease severity, treat CMV with a low threshold of surgery and no role for additional medical therapy, i.e. another uh, biological therapy. We don't have easy access to IL-12 or 23 inhibitors anyway in our country, uh, or beta-luzumab, which is an anti-integrin, which is also not so supplied. Sorry, can you please stop right up in another one minute, please? Thank you. Sure. So what happened next? Um, he crashed into, uh, he crashed on antivirals, additional medical therapy of thiopurines, and fleximab and weaning steroids, became septic, became very unwell, ended up in intensive care. His parents were getting more agitated, creating more problems. We, we had to put in a significant amount of human resources to defuse the situation. He, despite all this, he underwent a total abdominal colectomy with ileostomy with stage two planned in six to 12 weeks, months. I had the pleasure of reviewing him today with a much calmer family. He's doing very well, eating, drinking, mobilizing, and looking so much happier now that most of his colon has been removed. So finally, in summary, uh, I think we need to, with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, whichever form it takes, we need to consider positioning of therapy, the right therapy at the right time for the right person. Clinical algorithms are very useful uh, to provide a framework within which to practice, but often in the cold face, we need to adapt, use recent evidence and intuition for the best outcomes. And there's no doubt the best, the care of children with IBD and adults with IBD is complex and often requires multiple teams with excellent case management and parent management in our case. And um, finally, I'd uh, like to dedicate this talk to my father uh, who passed away four years ago with pancreatic cancer. Uh, he flew in the Indian Air Force and he would have been very pleased to hear his son present at your meeting. And I would be, of course, happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Mark Hollywood, for a wonderful uh, overview of an inflammatory bubble disease.